Greetings, witches, wizards, and magicians. The team at Avalanche Software has done a great job at teasing the main storyline of Hogwarts Legacy without actually giving away the plot. We know that we're attending Hogwarts as a new fifth year student in the late 1800s, that there's a mounting goblin rebellion, that there are dark wizards up to no good, and we know that our character has tapped into a source of ancient magic. At the very end of the latest gameplay showcase, we got a bonus clip. Let's break this down. Our character is walking through the headmaster's office. How do we know that this is the headmaster's office. The headmaster's office is described as a circular room, and the room depicted matches the one from the Harry Potter movies. Here are the similarities. In the middle of the room is a desk. There's a sitting room behind the desk. Bookshelves line the walls. Two staircases on either side lead up to an observation area, and there's a pensive. However, some things that don't match up with the books or films include the absence of portraits of old headmasters, but maybe they're all behind us. We don't see the sorting hat on the shelves here, but maybe back in the day it was stored somewhere else. And we don't see a telescope at the top of the stairs. Perhaps the observatory was a later renovation. Moving forward, at the top of the staircase, we come upon an open book floating above an altar. The small room has windows with designs of the sun, moon, and stars. The star symbol is the same as the one from the windows in the Ravenclaw common room. Pages fly into the book as we approach. Where did those come from? Were we carrying them? Are those the pages we've seen floating around the school? The book has a yellow quest symbol above it, meaning that this is a primary quest. The pages inside the book are the same from the concept artwork we've previously seen. I've tried translating the pages from the concept artwork. The only word I know for sure is the Welsh word for dragon. We will come back to deciphering the book pages in a minute. After getting sucked through the book, we can see a portrait in the background. The top of the closed book shows the same figure that's on the cover of the collector's edition book. That jewel around the figure's neck I think is actually an ancient rune. The rune is called Chilk, which means chalk handle chalice. And that rune behind her that looks like it might be a moon is actually the rune for protection, or you would. So, the figure could be the protector of a chalice or magical object. We'll come back to the rune in a bit. The accents in the room are for Slytherin House, meaning that the headmaster was in Slytherin. One more clue that this is the headmaster's office comes from the sorting hat quiz from Pottermore. One of the questions that is supposed to help sort users into their house includes this question. A troll has gone berserk in the headmaster's study at Hogwarts. It is about to smash, crush, and tear several irreplaceable items and treasures, including a cure for dragon pox, which the headmaster has nearly perfected, student records going back 1,000 years, and a mysterious handwritten book full of strange runes, believed to have belonged to Merlin. So, that directly ties the Book of Merlin to the headmaster's office, and this book has runes in the artwork. You're welcome. Let's go back to deciphering the artwork that can be found in the book. I was having trouble deciphering them until I came across another video by the Or Division. Link in the description. I decided that I wanted to dig into the rune interpretation a bit, especially because the second line wasn't discussed. We can study the runes on the centerpiece of concept artwork by looking at Anglo-Saxon Futhark. This inscription starts with Gifu, the symbol that looks like an X. This means gift and also concerns contracts and personal relationships. However, every rune can be reversed. This is called Merkstaff. We aren't necessarily sure which orientation these runes are in. We're going to be guessing somewhat. A negative interpretation of the Gifu rune would be greed, excessive sacrifice, or obligation. The second rune is Os, which has a few meanings including mouth, the power of speech, an ash tree. However, the rune might actually be an inverse and inverted fehu, which would mean loss. The third rune is man. It is the rune for mankind and has to do with social order and receiving support from someone. The fourth rune is again either os or a reverse inverted fehu. The fifth rune is the kanaz rune. In the reverse position, this symbol means defilement and or nakedness. That's somewhat fitting because this kneeling character is wearing only a mask. Hey, this is not a appropriate masquerade attire. The sixth rune is Isa. This rune is the symbol for ice and can mean stillness, or in a negative rune interpretation can mean treachery, blindness, or betrayal. The seventh rune is Ing. The meaning of this rune has to do with growth and fertility. However, a negative interpretation of this rune would mean powerlessness. The last rune on this line is Tear. It kind of looks like a T, doesn't it? This is the rune 
for strength and victory. Now, let's take a look at the line below. The first rune is Kanaz again, but this time it's depicted in its positive form and is shown as a variation. The meaning of this rune has to do with revelation and knowledge. The next rune is Tyr again, but depicted slightly differently from before. This is not to be confused with Lagu. This rune has to do with strength, leadership, power, and victory. The next rune is E. It looks like an M. It was the rune for horses, but also has to do with trust, loyalty, and partnership. The final rune is Rad. Isn't that rad? It looks like an R. This rune is associated with traveling. It is also associated with development and movement. So what does all of this mean? Well, it's going to depend on the interpreter. Now I know why Hermione took ancient runes class. Here's interpretation one. Humankind was greedy for the powers of an enchantress. They sought to steal her powers for the benefit of man. They learned that her wand of ash was the source of her power. Mankind defiled themselves by betraying the goddess. They left her powerless and celebrated their newfound strength. They continued to amass power and knowledge of the dark arts. Nothing could stop the Dark Ones as they continued to gain power. They coveted their power and only partnered with others like themselves. Eventually, they evolved into their own class of humans, the Purebloods. Interpretation 2 there once was a benevolent enchantress who brought a gift to humans. She gave them wands to cast spells and gave their mouths the words of magic. The goddess did everything she could to help humankind. The power of humans grew, but humans wanted more and defiled themselves by using the dark arts. The enchantress was betrayed. She felt powerless as humankind reached for godhood. She tried to tame them, sending forth creatures and monsters, but they were victorious against her. With magic, humans gained the power to create their own reality. The Enchantress did not give up and found some who were still loyal to her. With the help of her followers, they moved against the evil ones and created balance once again. As much as I like these two interpretations, I realize that one of the game's artists could have just scribbled some runes on the concept artwork and called it a day. So we might be here trying to apply meaning to something devoid of any meaning. I guess I'm willing to take that risk. I know that neither interpretation addressed the grail in the image, but I don't think it's a depiction of the grail. I mean, maybe it could have something to do with the grail quest, but I don't think it would be the same cup that legend has held the blood of Christ. In regards to the page with the dragons eating those poor helpless people, I tried translating the text into English. At first, it started sounding pretty good. Come out, come out, wallow, yes, wallow, yes. Okay, I can see people be wallowing with a bunch of dragons tearing their faces off, but then things start making less sense as the lines continue. Wonder, wonder, to grudge, one shawls, one shawls, light shawls, bored and lost he is. Yes, I am definitely lost and tired of trying to translate this concept artwork. This is starting to look like a web page layout. They normally will put in placeholder text so you can see the way the site will look when it's done. It's called lorem ipsum. It's just meaningless text to fill up the page. Maybe there is something to be found here if one understands Welsh. Anyone? Wizard here, calling for a friend. There's what looks like a two-headed eagle or bird in the top corner of the page. Double-headed mythological beasts have been used to symbolize empires or ruling. The Durmstrang crest, for example, has a double-headed eagle. Durmstrang is one of the schools that participated in the Triwizard Tournament during the fourth Harry Potter novel, Goblet of Fire. I'm not sure what this creature means in relation to this artwork, however. In regards to the dragons at the bottom, they are smaller dragons. There is a red dragon on the Welsh flag, another symbol of power and authority. I've got nothing else though. Looking at the third page of concept artwork, we see this. A figure with gray hair covering their face. The birds on either side are peacocks. Like phoenixes, peacocks are thought to have the powers of resurrection. The figure in the center may be a crone, an old woman with magical or supernatural powers. Not to be confused with a hag, a child-eating creature that looks human. Who is she? Why is she trying to hide her face? Why is this Welsh text behind her the same as on the other page? Anyway, let's head back to the headmaster's office. Even though we won't be understanding the cryptic artwork anytime soon, we can still talk about the direction of the story. I really love this narrative idea of getting sucked into Merlin's book. We can be transported by the book to almost any time or place. Who knows if this book will be sentient, or if this is even the first time we've come upon the book. At the very least, we know our character is being transported someplace important to the story, and it most likely has something to do with Merlin. Jumping into a painting, or in this case a book, is a great narrative device. Whatever world 
world we find ourselves in may have different rules than this one has. I'm hoping that wherever we end up, it is interactive and not just a cool cinematic. I love me a good cinematic, but it would be cool to experience history too, or maybe even alter it. What do you think? What's your book theory? Is it Merlin's book? Is there a story to be found on these pages or is it just some nice artwork? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching, Wizard Out.